Welcome to tonight's program on Thomas Nast. I'm Catherine Alger. I'm the president here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And often um, I enjoy telling you about our collection and all the things that we do for free, including these programs, um, access to our exhibitions, when the time comes to open up and happier and healthier times, um, it, we're always free to the public. But I also wanna let you know that we also support a lot of things. Um, we do our teacher training for free. So uh, we're doing it virtually now, of course, but when we have the building open, we bring in teachers, we give them a stipend, we feed them really well, give them access to our professionals, our materials, and, um, and uh, give them teaching materials for free as well. Uh, we also make it possible for hundreds of students all across the state to participate in History Day, um, which you know, requires funds for transportation, fees, and of course the materials for their projects. And you know, at the heart of our enterprise, we also support scholarship. So we are probably the largest funders of scholarship in early America in probably the world. And we fund um, academics just beginning and also people at all stages of their career. So we like to support um, our constituency and that's why we also turn around and ask you, our constituency, our community to support us. So I do encourage you to go to the website. There's a little support button. And that's when you're gonna realize that helping us out, helping us do good can be fun too, because there's gonna be a, a little thing there for the gala, which is coming up on November 17th. So you can buy a ticket, enjoy a great conversation with John Meacham and Emily Rooney and help us too. So thank you so much. And without further ado, let's get this program going. And I'm gonna give it to my friend, Gavin. Gavin, let's go. Thank you, Catherine, for that welcome. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbys, and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you uh, to our virtual program. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to extend a special welcome to anyone who might be attending a virtual MHS program for the first time. Uh, in these days of social distancing, we have taken to hosting virtual events. Um, we actually started uh, pretty much right off the bat in early April. Um, and we have online events planned for the rest of the calendar year, exploring many subjects of U.S. and Massachusetts history. Our program tonight uh, is very much directly related to our online exhibition, Who Counts? Um, I hope you'll all check it out if you have not done so already. Uh, it's a great show uh, and somehow incredibly relevant these days. Um, the show was originally planned to be a physical show uh, at the Mass Historical Society. Um, and as a part of that physical show, we had uh, intended to dedicate one room uh, to Thomas Nast, the father of American political street cartoons. Obviously, that didn't happen, uh, but we did build uh, an online exhibition as a companion website that explores the, the life of Thomas Nast. Uh, this is a really fun project. All the illustrations in it were done uh, by local independent artists. Um, so I hope that you will uh, check that out if, you have a, if you're interested in this program. Um, that brings us to uh, this evening's program, uh, which will include uh, Fiona Dean Tolleran and Pat Bagley. Um, uh, We'll be speaking on the life of Thomas Nast. Uh, Nast was a pioneer uh, in American political cartoons. Um, he created or popularized the Republican elephant, the Democratic donkey, and the modern depictions of Santa Claus. But while he helped create uh, modern American visual culture, he also presented conflicting and sometimes disturbing depictions of African Americans. These two experts uh, will help us better understand Nast and his legacy. Uh, Fiona Dean Hallern is the author of Thomas Nast, the father of modern political cartoons. She holds a PhD in American history from UCLA and has been supported in her research by grants from the NEH, uh, the Gilder Lerman Institute, the Huntington Library, and the University of Oxford. Uh, she now teaches in San Diego, California. Pat Bagley is the longest continually employed uh, full-time editorial cartoonist in America. He has created over 10,000 cartoons in the 40 years he's worked at the Salt Lake Tribune. He has won dozens of awards, um, including being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and was just selected as the National Cartoonist Society's Best Editorial Cartoonist of the Year. So uh, following uh, their conversation, we will open it up for Q&A. 
Um, but uh, we encourage everyone to use the Q&A function at the bottom of their screen. Um, and I just point out that um, you can actually type in questions anytime during the program. Uh, if it's particularly relevant to the subject being discussed, they might be answered or we'll try to get to them um, at the end. So without further ado, I would uh, encourage Pat and Fiona to join us. Um, um, what we've been asked to do is to begin by talking about Thomas Nast, um, both generally and in specific terms. And so uh, we have some images of Thomas Nast, beginning with a picture of Nast himself um, to show you. Uh, this is my favorite picture of Thomas Nast, both because I think he looks particularly um, handsome in this picture. Um, he was a person who was very humble in the sense that he was often self-deprecating, but he was also actually quite proud of his talent um, and happy with the celebrity that he earned in the 19th century. And I think that you see that in this picture, how much fun he's having. He and his friend Napoleon Cerrone, um, who was a photographer, used to sort of play dress up and take pictures. And that's what's happening here is that he put on this ruff and a blanket and is posing for Cerrone in his studios in New York. Thomas Nast um, was an immigrant to the United States. He uh, arrived in New York at age six um, in uh, 1846 and um, came with his mother and his sister. They left his native uh, Landau, Bavaria because his father was outspoken politically, uh, which turned out to be a family trait as it happened, um, and had to leave in uh, anticipation of the revolutions of 1848. Um, and Nast and his mother and sister made a life for themselves in Lower Manhattan. Um, and Nast transformed himself in the course of the 10 years or so after his arrival in the United States from really in some ways kind of a lost little boy into a really talented artist. He was not an academic person. He didn't love school. Um, and by the time he was 13 or 14, he was basically on the streets every day. He had stopped going to school and he did things like he went to art galleries and talked to the owners into letting him sit around drawing what he saw in the paintings or collect admissions quarters at the door. Um, and eventually at 15, he managed to get a professional position with a very precarious illustrated newspaper, Frank Leslie's Illustrated News, drawing and also working in the engraving room. Um, and from there, he went to several different places to work, ultimately landing at what would be his primary employer for much of the rest of his career, Harper's Weekly, which was the most widely read, the most popular um, illustrated newspaper of the time. Harper's Weekly had an incredible circulation as high as almost 300,000 copies, which since copies were passed from hand to hand and often posted in public places like um, pubs, many, many, many more people than that saw it. So it was really quite an impressively widely read newspaper slash magazine. Um, and he became over the course of a couple of decades, uh, an anchor in that institution, uh, the face of that institution in some ways. Um, he didn't write for it, but his cartoons were what everybody knew. Um, and they helped to shape the politics of the newspaper, the politics of those decades. And beginning during the Civil War era, but really significantly in its aftermath between about 1868 and the early 1880s, Thomas Nast was um, a visual voice, if that's not mixing um, too many modes of communication, for Republican politics in the United States and for all kinds of issues, important national issues related uh, to reconstruction, related to electoral politics, um, to social change. Um, and he pioneered a bunch of things about American political cartooning, not least the editorial independence of political cartoonists, which is something that Pat and I will talk about later. Um, I'm going to emphasize several things about Nast that I think are particularly important for understanding Nast's position relative to voting. But first, I want to hand it over to Pat because he also wants to make some remarks because Nast was the father of American political cartooning, not the first political cartoonist to be influential in the United States, but the first to really make a life out of it and to create a world for consumption of political cartoons as a form of politics and also as a form of visual entertainment, especially of, of satire. Um, he is a central figure for all political cartoonists in this country. And so Pat, um, as 
a influential, widely read and appreciated political cartoonist, this is a person for whom, against whom Pat is in some ways in dialogue at all times. Um, so Pat, why don't you take it away and talk for a little while and, and then I'll come back. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're absolutely right about his centrality to American cartooning. Uh, and you have to kind of understand what uh, media was like back then, because back then, media and magazines, or uh, I'm sorry, newspapers and magazines were the media. Mm -hmm. They were everything. Um, and newspapers around the country, in every city in America had three, four, five newspapers. And usually they um, uh, 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 were projecting some political view. Uh, but all these newspapers also had at least two or three cartoonists because you couldn't do photographs in the paper and you had to have somebody illustrate them. And um, so being a cartoonist back then was a, a viable thing to do. Uh, today in America, uh, I am competing with uh, the internet, with Facebook, with Twitter, um, and uh, you know all these memes that are going around. Back then, they owned all of it. And Thomas Nast was one of the best. And uh, he was huge. I mean, he was a rock star back then. You know, everybody knew who, who Nast was. Uh, anyway, let's go. And this is why he's so influential. This is why these images are so influential. Let's go to the first picture. Okay, it's Santa Claus, right? You recognize Santa Claus. But before Nast, Santa Claus could be skinny, make you be tall. Uh, many different versions of Santa Claus. Nast came from Germany and he brought his own German version of Santa Claus to America. And this is the Santa Claus that we still recognize today. You know, fat and jolly, right? Kind of a big deal. There's another thing that he did uh, for us politically so that we could recognize things. And he was, I could tell by the way he was cartooning that he was trying to figure it out. Uh, but he gave us this legacy of the elephant and the donkey. Can we go to the next cartoon? Okay, so there you see the elephant, the Republican vote, and there is a donkey wearing a lion's mane, braying like an ass, right? And that's the Democratic Party. And then there are all these other animals that represent different things, but he's still trying to work it out. And I, I can definitely uh, uh, relate to what he's doing here. Uh, how about the next one? Okay, there you see, and that's not Lincoln in the background. Fiona, do you remember what who, who that is? It's um, it's Carl Schurz. Yeah, Schurz. Yeah, Schurz. But a Republican, and it says on the elephant, pretty much let sleeping dogs lie. You know, their economic plan seems to be okay. And this guy in the foreground, Thomas Bedard. Is that right? He's trying to keep the Democrats from doing something really economically dumb. You know, pulling him back off from the cliff. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, and here is an election where the, the Republicans win, but they get beat up really badly in the process. So anyway, he institutes, he institutionalizes these images of the elephant being the Republicans and the donkeys being uh, the Democrats. And we still use it today. Like, for instance, the next cartoon. This is my cartoon. Uh, and this is about the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation. The Democrats saying Amy Co Coney Barrett is, the elephant says, what? You mean Catholic? Listen to this atheist bigot smear a woman for her faith. And the donkey's saying, that's not, I, I'm not. Oh, so now you're calling me a liar? Look at me being persecuted. So it's, it's a handy shorthand to use when you're doing cartoons. Okay, let's go to the last one. Okay, this is kind of personal. I'm here in Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, one of the things you have to know about Nast is he was kind of anti-Catholic. And so you hear, here you see the Capitol Dome and on it is written, religious liberty is guaranteed but can we allow foreign reptiles to crawl all over us, U.S.? And on the left, 
you see this crocodile crawling up on top of the Capitol Dome. But if you look at it sideways, that mouth of the crocodile is kind of like the bishop's mitre. It's kind of like the Pope's hat. Okay, and on the right side, you've got, uh, uh, th this is a, the tabernacle in Salt Lake City is the shell of the turtle. And that's the Mormon church. And this is kind of curious in a few ways. Like, for instance, why are you calling the Mormon church a foreign reptile? Um, well, that's because back in the day, back in the time when he was doing these cartoons, the Mormon church, the LDS church, was mostly made up of immigrants. Um, and so I thought about, you know, making a, a turtle, a representative of, you know, Mormon Utahns, but didn't quite work. <laughs> um, but we have, we'll have more to say about Nast and uh, his view of the Catholic Church later on. Um, and that's the last slide that I've got. But like I say, he, he worked with these images and he was develop, developing them all the time. Some of them stuck, like the um, Santa. Santa kind of stuck. And the donkey and the elephant definitely stuck. Uh, this, you know, Catholics being represented by crocodile and Mormons being represented by uh, a turtle didn't quite stick. Okay, back to you. Well, so one of the things that the MHS is um, <coughs> at the moment um, and given their planning process has clearly been interested in for quite some time um, is the question of voting. Um, and what I'm really thankful to them for tonight is the opportunity to talk about NAST in that framework. Um, because people are fascinated by NAST, but they're often interested in particular components of NAST's work. So um, I think we're all interested in Santa at various times of the year, um, because that iconography is all around us in this country, um, and his contribution to it is essential. Um, but voting, especially voting that is um, heavily is fraught with significant consequences. That's something that's more iterative. It's sometimes more important to us and other times we take a breather from thinking about it. For NAS, that was an essential component of his thinking about um, American citizenship, about what it meant to be part of the nation, um, and about how decisions are made, where power lies. Uh, it's absolutely true what Pat says about Nast being a celebrity. He went to Washington in the early 1870s, um, which was a very productive time for him professionally um, and personally. He and his wife had several children in those years. Um, and he was amazed himself. He wrote letters back to his wife saying, I'm famous everywhere I go. People want to shake my hand and other people give me the side eye. And he, of course, didn't say side eye, but that's what it was. He was at a party in Washington in those years um, where uh, Carl Schurz, who was in the cartoon Pat showed earlier, came up and essentially threatened him, said to him, like, if you don't stop drawing me, then I'm going to call up the Harper brothers and they'll fire you. Um, and Nast being who he was, uh, cartoonists tend to be pugnacious. It's not a good idea to start a fight with a cartoonist. It will not go well for you. Um, and Nast essentially said to this senator, um, try me, bring it. And sure enough, when the um, question was uh, litigated in a bunch of letters back and forth between NAST and NAST's editor, George William Curtis, who was the sort of person who had a lot of um, coffee dates with senators, um, NAST's actual boss, Fletcher Harper, the man who was the uh, owner and operator, a publisher of Harper's Weekly, his position was, we're not in the business of making senators happy. We're in the business of commenting on American politics. And if Senator Schertz is unhappy, I guess that's his problem. Um, and so Nast was vindicated in this moment. Um, but he said um, openly in conversations he had for a while, he engaged in a, um, a really popular form of lecture, not unlike what we're doing tonight, um, the Lyceum Circuit, in which people who were prominent would tour the country giving talks. And given that there wasn't a ton to do in the evening in the 19th century, especially in the wintertime, which was the season for these kinds of talks, 
Um, and if those of you who are familiar with the Chautauqua series, that's um, the same thing. Uh, folks like Thomas Nest would show up in your town and they would give a lecture and everyone would go and um, pay a couple of dollars for the opportunity to listen to him talk. And in his case, he would do chalk talks where there would be a chalkboard and he would draw while he talked. Um, and he used, and he had a prepared set of remarks that he gave, which he was extremely anxious about. He wrote all kinds of letters home to his wife about how he hated it and it was horrible and he would give anything not to have to do it. And could he tell them that he was sick and they would let him go <laughs> home? He was so nervous. Um, and one of the things he said in this prepare, we have the remarks, they've survived um, and in archival collections. And one of the things he says is he talks about um, giving, uh, he talks about an exhibition of, of caricatures that he went to and how he walked around listening to people comment on their own caricatures, on what they thought of being caricatured and how unhappy it made people, how they loved other people's caricatures. And they laughed and they thought it was hilarious. And then they got to themselves in this set of images and suddenly it was just not funny at all. And how dare they? And so this is the world he lived in, in which he produced an artistic product, a political commentary that people loved, that they consumed widely, that they celebrated him for, but he also antagonized a ton of people. And so for every fan, he also had an enemy. Um, and it's true also what Pat says about shorthand images, such as the ones we see on the screen right now, one of the things political cartoonists do, which Pat and I can talk about later, is they employ or they originate um, images that we can all recognize instantly. Because one of the benefits of political cartooning, as opposed to political analysis in print, um, political analysis in, in language, is that you can look at the cartoon and get the point instantly. So for example, um, if we were to go back to the image from um, two pictures ago of the Republican elephant, this image, um, the point that Nast was making here, and he quotes uh, at, as the caption, one more such fight and I shall be undone. Um, the point he's making is that sometimes a victory, right, a Pyrrhic victory in this case, a victory is so hard fought and hard won that it's not really worth it, that you've harmed yourself by what it took to, to win. Um, and that was his view in this case. And so one of the things he's using here is a symbol that everyone who was his fan would recognize of the Republican Party. And then he has created an image in which you understand without having to think about it, without having to interpret what you're seeing, that the party is in trouble, that the party may have won, but that victory is a problem for the future. Um, and so the value of shorthand for cartoonists is now and was then that the viewer can get the joke just like that. And that's desirable. It's what makes political cartooning entertaining and, and preferable for some folks or in some circumstances to reading an editorial, right? Which is longer, it requires you to really focus. A cartoon can catch your attention, amuse you and provoke you much more quickly. And it does that in part because it knows that you will recognize some of these symbols. So I want to focus on and highlight because of the excellent online exhibit that the MHS has created in which, and I, I should say before I go to that, there is a whole section in the exhibit that talks about how cartoonists work, what they do, and it includes a discussion of the creation of symbols and the ways that symbolic images are used in cartooning. So if you're interested in cartooning in general and its component parts, the MHS has created a subsection of the exhibit for you. Um, but I want to focus in part on, on four things I think are important to know about NAST when it comes to voting, because that's really what the exhibit is about, is how cartoonists approach voting. And I do have a couple of images to show you, but there are also images that are in the exhibit that I think are important. So I want to start um, by talking about voting as central to citizenship. And this is a very provocative image of NAST, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but I, I'm not talking about it first. Um, so you can have a chance to look at it. Oh, or we can look at something else. It's whatever. It's all good. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. It's all it good. works. I, I'm, I find this image really fascinating. Um, uh, but the first thing I want to talk about is how central NAS thought that voting was to citizenship. In the exhibit online, um, the MHS includes um, a high quality image of a paired cartoon by NAST, Shall I Trust These Men and Not This Man? 
Um, this was a cartoon from after the Civil War in which Nast essentially said, why are we allowing Confederates, particularly Confederate leaders, um, generals, uh, people like Jefferson Davis, why would we ever welcome those people back into full citizenship, including voting rights? So he's commenting on the pardon policy under Johnson when we have not welcomed to full citizenship, which means voting rights, uh, black veterans. And so shall I trust these men has the Confederate um, leadership uh, coming to Lady Liberty and asking for forgiveness. And then the, the companion panel on the other side of Harper's Weekly showed her gesturing to, um, standing next to her, a black veteran who had lost a leg. And in the image is the ballot box, which the MHS has featured as one of the core components of cartoon representations of voting. Um, and that is a, a good example of Nast's view of voting as central to citizenship. From his point of view, it, you could not be equal within the United States if you were not free to vote. And so he repeatedly created cartoons in which the right to vote was the right to be an American. So the second one, uh, which I think we see here um, in some ways, and then I'll come back to this uh, in a later one too, is that Nast always emphasized that voting was potentially dangerous. He understood that to vote was to put yourself at the center of the action. And because of that, to vote meant that you were um, vulnerable to the opposition of other Americans and that that opposition might not be at the ballot box. That opposition might be deadly. Um, and so one of the things you see here is a portrayal by him of a man who is ready and able to defend his right to vote. This is part of a series of cartoons um, that are about the effort to suppress the vote of black men, particularly black veterans during reconstruction. Um, and it's very common in NAS cartoons, and you'll see it in the next one, to show um, a black man who has been murdered to prevent his voting. Um, so you can see that here. This is called One Vote Less. And in many cases, the cap, including this one, the captions and the materials that are written into the cartoon are drawn from statements in Southern newspapers. Um, so as that's the case here with the Richmond Whig. So what Nass did was he was shocked, not only by the violence against black voters in the former Confederacy, he was also shocked by the glee with which that violence was greeted in some publications in those states. And so he often would simultaneously attack the violence itself and defend by extension the black voter and also attack the idea that this was desirable, that this was the way that the white populations of those places were going to ensure their own right to vote was by suppressing the vote of black men. Um, and so if we return to the previous slide, one of the things you can see is there are many cartoons by Nast in which we see black voters and sometimes their families too, who have suffered. So for example, in the online exhibit, there's patients on a monument which shows a black veteran at the top of a monument. The monument itself is covered in quotes from Southern newspapers that um, celebrate the suppression of black voters. And at the bottom of the monument is this man's wife and two children who are dead. Um, this is a very different cartoon. And one of the things I find really compelling about it is Nast's placement of this man right at the center um, he's made some artistic choices that emphasize the potential um, violence in this image. The man looks directly at us, for example, um, with his eyes wide open. His finger is on the cock of, his, the, of the gun, right? He is ready to use that weapon. Um, and he's surrounded by the results of this racist violence. And so one of the things Nast is saying very openly here, which he often he, he wasn't always this straightforward, um, is that there's only so much violence anyone will tolerate before they defend themselves. And that white Americans needed to understand that voting was such a central component of American identity that black men would be moved probably to defend it. And that when they did, the fault in that, the source of that violence would not lie with them, but rather with what had been done to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to emphasize that he really believed in the centrality of voting for citizenship, but he knew, he always knew, that voting was something that could come with a price, um, and that voting was something that put you uh, in the sights, so to speak, of people who didn't want you to participate. Third, um, 
we have to confront, and this image is a complicated part of that, the fact that Nast himself held racist views. And so one of the things about Nast that's really complicated is that not only was he anti-Catholic and anti-Irish, which went together sometimes and other times could be separated in his work, um, he was also not a believer in black equality. So he believed very deeply in the right of black Americans, black men to vote. He did not really support women voting in general uh, or really many of the other things about what women were asking for in the 19th century. Um, so he was sometimes a passionate defender of the rights of black Americans to be equals in terms of citizenship and to be equals socially, to own land and to have safe families. Um, but there are other instances in which, and they are on the online exhibit, um, in which asked um, portrayed black voters as ignorant, as easily led by uh, the Republican party, um, and as sometimes uh, people who are not yet fit for full citizenship, including voting. And so it's a balance um, in his work between the parts of his work, which were groundbreaking for his time in their defense of equality and justice and the parts of his work, which um, played to his own and others racism at that time. The last thing I want to point out is that uh, the online exhibit that talks about the ways in which voting was vulnerable to corruption. And that was something that was really important to Nast as well. And he was opposed to corruption in general, in, especially in cities um, where, like New York, where he lived for many years. And then uh, he moved to New Jersey, but he still remained, uh, he worked in New York. So he was very interested in New York politics. Um, and he was well aware of many of the concerns about voting and about its honesty, which animated political discourse at that time and which continues to be a concern for us today. That was a central part. He knew that not only could you prevent people from voting, a form of corruption in voting, but that also you could manipulate systems of voting. Um, and his position was that all corruption in politics was a problem. He was very black and whiteness thinking in that regard. Um, and that in particular, Particular, that voting had a kind of sacred nature and tampering with voting was something that was uh, at the very top of the sins committed in the course of political corruption. So those are the four things that I think are the most important and I think they connect very meaningfully to what the MHS has done online. Um, and then, so Pat and I were planning for um, a little while to, to talk with each other about cartooning and politics um, and then to entertain questions. So uh, if I could ask our moderators, they, they can take the screen down and um, Pat and I can be visible if that's okay with everybody. Hey. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, so Pat, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that throughout his career, as you know, uh, Thomas Nast was um, pressured constantly by people to back off. And he constantly received well-meaning suggestions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, so I'm curious, since you are such a successful cartoonist and have been for so long, how that balance works for you and what you think of Nast's efforts to establish editorial independence. You know, nothing has changed. Um, my publisher uh, has, he, he's part of the fabric of the community in Utah. And he's received a lot of pressure to rein me in. And I've got to say that he's, he's done this right and that he said, I can't, <laughs> I can't rein him in. Um, and he's given me a lot of liberty to do what I need to do to be successful, to be a good cartoonist. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, Thomas Nast apparently got a lot of suggestions where you, know, you should draw this and that and that. I, you know, almost every single day somebody says, do this cartoon and and you don't even have to pay me <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know usually what I respond to is not you know ideas for cartoons but subjects for cartoons you know if somebody sends in an email and they say you should address this issue um, I'll think about it I'll go you know you may have something there absolutely I think it's your turn to ask a question. Okay, I got to ask a question. So, uh, little, well, uh, Thomas Nass moved to New Jersey, correct? 
Yes. And so this has got to be a good 25, 30 years ago that I went to visit friends in New Jersey and they took me to the Thomas Nast mansion. Mm. And it was actually for sale at the time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that expensive. I mean, it was a big house, but it was kind of run down. And, um, um, and I thought, you know, I could maybe marshal enough resources because it wasn't that much. And, and the economy at the time was not that great. Um, but I'm always kind of curious whatever happened to the mansion. I don't know if you know, or so maybe it's still there. Yeah, it's still there. It's in Morristown. I'm just looking at my book for a list of illustrations. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's still there and uh, it's a private home, but you can look at it. There is a museum in a home to him, which contains many um, objects related to him. Um, but as I understand it is not the same house. Um, I have a photograph of the house in my book. Um, I'm seeing if I can find it. Um, and he loved that house. He and his wife moved, there we go. Um, so, Gotta love technology. There's the house. Yep. There you go. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a perfectly nice house. Um, he and his wife moved there because he said he had been threatened by Boss Tweed, um, which uh, his story was, and it's hard to know how much of this story was um, nasty and exaggeration and how much of it <laughs> was um, absolutely true. But he, his story was that he noticed some big hulking folks lurking outside of he and his wife's house in Harlem, uh, which was a village at the time, um, and uh, was aware that that was probably intimidation from the Tweed Ring. And then a lawyer came for tea and offered him a great deal of money if he would go on vacation to Europe for, say, a year or two, <laughs> um, which he declined. Um, and then essentially said to him, well, if you won't take this offer to go on vacation, then things will not be good for you. And, and he was the type of person to respond to that by working twice as hard and hitting twice as hard. But he had a wife and small child and he um, was not inclined to uh, put them in a position to be afraid. And so they moved to Morristown um, and a few months later, the records are a little unclear, they bought that house and then he spent the next couple of decades of uh, fancying it up. And I don't mean fixing it up. I mean, doing things like going to the Centennial uh, in 1876 and buying, as far as one can tell, everything in sight. I mean, he bought a stair uh, rail. He bought, <laughs> he bought a fencing. Um, like, I didn't know you could just buy a fence out at like a fair, but he did. Um, and, um, and you can kind of see what the house would have been like if you look at some of his Christmas illustrations that have backgrounds. Uh, because the backgrounds were drawn from his own home. And so when you see the Christmas illustrations where there's like a mantle and there's all this stuff on the walls, that's his house. Um, and also uh, there are, uh, in archival collections in a couple of places, there are these auction lists. When he died, um, his belongings were auctioned. And in these auction lists, you get a sense of what that house must have been like because there are, are whole categories for suits of armor and daggers and, you know, silver cups and so he filled it with interesting he, things that he liked he, to was, look at. he was a shopper yeah and um and then he used those things as props in his oh, cartoons. Okay. um many people are aware that the women in his cartoons are almost always his wife uh sally who he would draw and so he had various props in the house so if if you see a cartoon and there's like a suit of armor probably that's a suit of armor that was in his house um and, uh, and it was inspiring. He liked to surround himself with interesting looking things. So yeah, that house is still there. Uh, as far as one can tell, it looks like it's been fixed up. So I think you missed your moment. That's the ball. Uh, and okay, but, but, but you're talking about his wife, Sally. Yes. And I think I remember this from your book is that she was very elegant and, and he was kind of short and dumpy. Is that right? It was. Um, when they first were dating in 1860 and 1861, um, they, there's a series of letters that survive between them where um, they refer to him as Little Piggy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then there, when they went on honeymoon, they went to Niagara Falls, which was the, the hot thing to do for middle class couples at the time. And they wrote letters back to her parents. Uh, by that point, his family was gone. Um, but they wrote to her mother. 
And she wrote the letter because her handwriting was elegant, whereas his handwriting was atrocious and his spelling was terrible. Oh, he's a cartoonist. Well, that's true. But I think also when you, he arrived at age six and he spoke German, but he didn't read or write because he was too young. And he went to school and everyone spoke English and he couldn't understand. Um, and he had a couple of bad experiences where, for example, he got spanked because another kid played a trick on him. Um, and he just hated school. And so his education was very rich in the sense that he and Sally read Shakespeare and they read the newspaper every day. And it was very shallow in the sense that he had never been in a formal educational environment, learning to hold a pencil, learning to write, learning to spell. So she wrote their letters. And in these mm. honeymoon letters, she's her beautiful handwriting. She's writing all of the stuff. And then he's drawn little pictures. This is at the Morristown <laughs> Public Library. And you can go see it. It's in their archival collection. He's drawn these little pictures. And in the pictures, she is tall and slender and elegant. And he is truly a little troll. Um, and if, if you are familiar with them in, in Peanuts, um, the kid who always has a cloud of dirt around him. Yeah. Um, that's the way he drew himself. Um, and so, yeah, he was very self-deprecating in that regard. Whereas if you look at photographs of him, he was beautifully dressed. He was beautifully groomed. Um, he was quite an elegant man. No, oh, but, but <laughs> the whole self-deprecation -de thing appeals to me. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, yes, it's because, well, I mean, you, you inflict this stuff on other people, but you have to accept that it can come back on you too. Well, that's true. I, I remember, uh, sorry, I remember doing a cartoon where um, if we have two newspapers in Salt Lake City, there's the Deseret News, which is owned by the church, and there's the Tribune, the Salt Lake Tribune, which I work for. And this is years ago, but something happened, and I thought, if this was the Deseret News, I would do this cartoon. But this happened to us, so what should I do? So I go, you know, what's fair for the goose is fair for the gander. So I did the cartoon and I got to give it to my editors. We published it. Well, and this is one of the things about Nass's career. Um, when I said he fought for editorial independence, what I meant was he didn't just fight the external public, people like Carl Schurz who didn't like it. He had to fight inside of Harper's Weekly because his, oh, yeah. editor, his editor thought First of all, his editor thought that what the editor wrote about politics and what Nast cartooned should go together, that there should be yep. no light between them. And given that the two of them totally disagreed and were profoundly different men, there was no chance of that. And as long as Fletcher Harper lived, Fletcher Harper protected Nast and he was free to do what he wanted. Unfortunately, Fletcher Harper's death coincided with the crisis of the election of 1876. And so given that the exhibit is about voting, one of the things that happened to Nast is that right at the moment when the United States was up to its eyeballs in a controversy about who had won a presidential election, where there had been dishonest voting, which was alleged in several states and seems very likely that there was massive amounts of voter fraud in those states, my home state, South Carolina being one of them. Um, and this question, this unresolved question for months about who should be president next, at that precise moment, Thomas Nast effectively lost his protector. And so he wanted to keep fighting. Particularly, he wanted to keep fighting for the rights of Black Americans in uh, what was now the Redemption South. The, the white Democrats had taken back the state governments in state after state, ending Reconstruction, ending efforts to help freed people, ending efforts to protect voting with federal soldiers. Um, and it looked like that was headed for a total uh, dismantling of the agenda uh, of Reconstruction. And Nast saw that and thought it was tragic and he wanted to stop it. But George William Curtis, his editor, took the position, which was taken by many uh, members of the intellectual elite and social elite of the Northeast at that time, that they had basically tried to intervene and it had been a failure and that it was time to turn their attention to something else. And Nast didn't want to do it, and they forced him to shut up. Um, mm. And the reason they were able to do it is because the person who had been the protective hand for Nast was gone. And so it's kind of tragic because that was the moment of all the moments that the United States really needed him. I mean, he's famous for 
bringing down a tweed ring, but the tweed ring was just New York City. Um, this was a national electoral crisis. And in that moment, the one of the most powerful voices in American politics was basically silenced because an internal dispute at his newspaper over whether or not he should be able to say what he thought didn't go his way. Okay, so Tweed drew for Harper's, but he drew for other outlets as well. Nast, yes, he drew for Harper's. That was He had a contract with Harper's annually, um, mm -hmm. which was extremely lucrative. I mean, he made a ton of money, but he was allowed to work elsewhere, not only um, as a cartoonist, but in other ways. So for example, in the Chalk Talks, he made like eight times as much money in a season doing Chalk Talks as he got from Harper's, even though his contract with Harper's was really lucrative. Um, he also illustrated for lots and lots of like almanacs and calendars, um, Christmas calendars, and uh, illustrated books, sometimes satirical political books, sometimes just regular books, um, some of which were published by the Harper's Publishing House. So it wasn't always outside the family, so to speak. Um, sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't. Uh, but he, they didn't control him. And in fact, repeatedly, that was his uh, lever, was that he said, well, if you try to tell me what to do, I'll go somewhere else. And uh, ultimately, mm -hmm. that is what happened, but it didn't work out for him. So a quick uh, history of what happened. I mean, what happened to him? Oh, when he left? Yeah. Yeah, so he rage quit, as we call it today, um, after, again, being told, like, no, we're not going to publish that. You can't do that. Um, he was, that was it. He was done. And what he, the way he did it was, which will be very familiar to anyone who's ever sent an angry email, is that he sent the, the contract back to New York unsigned. And that was a signal, like, right, go away. I'm not working <laughs> anymore. Um, and for a little while, he sort of uh, coasted right? I'm famous. I quit. Everyone knows it. Ha ha. And then he started trying to work in a more serious way. And his dream all along had been to have his own paper. He thought, well, if I'm my own boss, there'll be nobody to tell me no, which was a good idea, right? That's true. The problem yeah, was- Cartoonists are really bad bosses. We, we, we were well, that, bad businessmen. Bad businessmen. He, yes. And the other problem was that at almost the moment that he rage quit from Harper's Weekly, he lost a huge amount of money that he had invested in a fraudulent uh, investment bank. So the same Grant and Ward, the same company that President Grant had put all his money in because his son was one of the named partners, um, the other named partner, Ward, was a crook. And Damn. he ran away with all the money. And that's one, so the, for people who know the story of U.S. Grant's memoirs, that's one reason Grant had to write the memoirs was because he was broke, because he'd lost all his money. Well, Nast had invested in that same bank because he and Grant were kind of acquaintances and he lost all his money too. So he was undercapitalized. And as you say, he was a terrible businessman. And then the other problem was that Tammany by that time was resurgent and Tammany controlled newspaper distribution. Hmm. And so you can make the best newspaper in the world. People could want to buy it, but if it can't be on the newsstand, if no one can get it, then you're out of luck. Um, he was also terrible at selling ads. And so, you know, as a publisher, he was no good, which he didn't realize that until it was too late. So he did start a newspaper, Nass Weekly, and it only ran for about seven months. The only complete set of it is at the University of Minnesota in their archive. Um, you can go see it there. I, I would, maybe they've digitized it. I would be wonderful if they've digitized it. And one of the sad things about it is you can track the decline of his talent because he had developed a, um, a problem with his shoulder, like, a, like some tendonitis probably um, in the 1880s. And by the time he was doing Nast's Weekly, um, he, you could tell. He couldn't do the, the fine cross hatching that you see in some of these. He couldn't um, keep a line going. Um, so he would so he would start with a nice strong line and it would kind of peter out. Um, the precision of his caricatures was affected because his hand hurt all the time and his arm just, it, it trembled. I, 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 I have friends who have experienced the same thing. Yeah. Even today. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, it's interesting. I was reading uh, last year, I was reading quite a lot about illustrators um, in Istanbul in the, seven, the 18th and 19th centuries. And one of the things that it talked a lot about, um, because I was reading um, Orhan Pamuk, um, so if people are familiar with um, My Name is Red, this very famous novel. And it, they were talking about the strain on the eyes of illustrators prior to artificial light. 
Um, and I think it's interesting to think about the ways that artists uh, engage in this activity and then their body has to cooperate. And in Nast's case, it stopped cooperating. And so his mind was going just like always, but his arm and his hand just wouldn't do it. And just so- Just a little curiosity, how old was he? Oh, he wasn't even 60. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. But, um, but you look at the, the quality of the work and, and the amount of the work and you can see how he just wore himself out. Oh yeah, during the height of the Tweed campaign, in 1876, during the height of the controversy over um, Rutherford B. Hayes, he was, um, I mean, he was drawing five cartoons, six cartoons a week, all of them this big. So I see Gavin, I think oh, maybe- oh, and, and They're all incredibly detailed and- Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. Yes, incredibly detailed. Mm-hmm. So, so Gavin, I think to- it's time for questions. Questions? Yeah, it might be good to take some, although um, it, Nast's life does come to a dramatic end, if you'd like to uh, yeah. finish that. <laughs> uh, yes, Nast, uh, he, he was out of money, um, really out of money, and so he needed a job, and, and he had, I noticed on your uh, exhibit, you talk about how much Roosevelt had enjoyed his cartoons as a child. Nast had defended Roosevelt. When Roosevelt was the commissioner of police in New York and was trying to shut down bars, Nast had defended him, saying like, yes, shut down all the drinking on Sunday, that's very immoral. And that was one of the bases for their affinity, so when Nass was out of money, he called the new Roosevelt administration and said, help. Um, and they, because he thought they would give him a diplomatic post. And they gave out diplomatic posts to all kinds of people, right? I mean, Bret Hart got one in Scotland, which is kind of nice. But instead, <laughs> that, I don't know if it was because he was too late, right? You have to get at the front of the line. But he got uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador, which was famous for yellow fever. And sure enough, he got there and within a few months. He made friends. He was friends with the British consul. It was going okay emotionally. Although his letters home to Sally are pretty sad because um, they had a really powerful love affair. And so he was very sad to be separated from her, but he wouldn't let her come because it was dangerous. And he was right because he got sick and he literally, he got into his hammock, the British consul wrote to her on the Monday and by Friday he was gone. Oh. Yeah, it's really sad. The worst part is that apparently the State Department never sent her a, a like condolences telegram, and she was very angry. Okay, I'll be right back. You okay. talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, man. So we have uh, a couple questions. Uh, we actually have a, a good number of questions. Um, so Gerald wrote, uh, I have two questions. Uh, was this imagery of animals unique to Nast? In the online ex- exhibition, it says which is a good sign. He's apparently looking at the online ex- exhibition. Uh, uh, in 1873, T- Tweed was convicted of graft and served a year in prison. Sued by the state of New York, he fled to Spain, where officials identified Tweed from the NAS drawing on the cover of Harper's. Could you expand on the circulation of these images through uh, the Atlantic and his impact outside the U.S.? Thanks so much for a fascinating talk. So I guess the two questions was, was uh, was the animals unique uh, and a little bit more about the uh, capture of Nast? Uh, of Tweet. Tweet. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, no, it's totally not unique. One of the things Pat said, um, which is absolutely true, and can I just point out that while Pat's out of his chair, the central figure in the painting behind Pat's chair is Pat Bagley. Um, so, uh, so it's absolutely the case that Nast did not cr- invent the democratic donkey. So in this question about the use of animals, animal imagery is commonplace. So if anyone's familiar, um, for example, with um, the cartoonist uh, Joseph Kepler or with Matt Morgan, they routinely would use stuff. And sometimes they portrayed what looks like Nast as a monkey with a pencil in his tail. Um, so there's lots of animal portrayals and the donkey is a very, uh, a much older image. Um, it had been used for Democrats for some time because of its other name, right? The jackass. Um, mm. and, and I'm not like, I don't know if there's actually a biological difference between the two, but, um, in, in terms of symbolism, it's the same. Uh, but the elephant was his invention. So that's why when we talk about him, we often say he popularized and invented these images is because the elephant was his creation, but the donkey was not. But he tended to, he made the donkey into kind of this eternal um, symbol. But there are lots of of uh, examples in political cartooning, both before Nast and since, where animals become the um, symbol of some quality, right? So foxes for being wily, 
um, and often birds. And sometimes the symbol is a cultural association with the animal and other times it's a literary reference. So for example, to Poe, right? And so they'll take something where there's a famous animal in some work of literature and then they'll transpose it into the cartoon. That's really common for cartoonists. Not everybody is fun to caricature and not all cartoonists like to caricature. And so there's various ways to do it. Uh, and so the other question was about the circulation of his cartoons uh, throughout the Atlantic world and, and internationally. So we actually don't know that much about that. Um, one of the problems with ephemera like newspapers is that they disintegrate. Um, and so one of the stories which um, is in the, the uh, 2007, I think, biography of Tweed, which is a great book, if you haven't read it, um, by Ackerman, is um, the story that, that Tweed actually had them in his luggage um, for reasons nobody really understands. And that that's where they saw them as they were going through his luggage um, looking for contraband. And they found these cartoons and were like, who is this guy? Oh. Um, <laughs> that's one of the stories. So I don't, it's not necessarily the case that Tweed gets caught because the Spaniards just have Harper's Weekly. Just, I don't know of any evidence that Harper's was sending significant numbers of uh, copies of its editions overseas. But he was, he was recognized from the cartoons. That's the story. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and, and it's hard to imagine why they would have um, pulled him from the customs line otherwise. Um, and so, so it's, uh, and, you know, he was fleeing because he didn't want to be imprisoned, which with good reason, because it ended up that it broke his health and he died um, relatively young. So, so, that, so one of the things is we know that some people were reading Harper's Weekly um, in Europe, probably Americans overseas, and then other people who were interested in American politics. There's really very little information that would help us to know how many copies went overseas, who was reading it exactly, and what they thought of it. So we have a question from EJ. Um, and actually, just to point out, EJ was one of the uh, artists who did the biography of uh, Nass that's on our website. Um, and she said, uh, since Nass cartoons were turned into printable illustrations by an engraver, why didn't the engraver make up for uh, problems with Nast's later originals? Um, because some of the images I'm referencing were in Nass Weekly at the end. And so first of all, by then, they had different methods for printing images. So there have been improvements in the technology that made it faster and easier. Um, and so it was a different way of doing it. Um, and then secondly, they were working for him. And so, and he didn't have a lot of money. And so the available inputs were just different. They, they, there was some embellishment that happened early in his career. And in fact, he got in trouble sometimes, EJ. Um, when During the Civil War, there were several instances where war correspondents, um, such as the Wode brothers, um, would send in drawings from the front and Nast would be the engraver. He would do the woodcut and he would put his own name on it. And so there's um, a book about them in which there's this very um, uh, straightforward insult to Nast uh, deep in the book because the Wodes apparently despised him based on the fact that he plagiarized some of their images, which, you know, I mean, understandable. Um, mm. So there were instances in which people put their name on things, they changed things, they put in and took out things. But at this late stage in his career, he just, he didn't have that kind of resource and it didn't quite work that way anymore. Um, so, uh, Marla, um, was, oops, sorry. There's a question. Question from Clay for Pat that I'm actually really interested in. Sure. Um, and it, it's, it's sort of for me, but it's sort of for Pat in the sense that the question is about how we get to the more simple style of modern political cartooning. Um, and I will say very, even by the end of Nast's lifetime, his style was out of fashion. Color mm -hmm. was in, simplicity was in, a three-dimensionality that his lacked was in with shading. Um, and then Pat, what do you think about this sort of more modern style in the 20th century? Well, I mean, it's always evolving. It's always changing. Uh, there were the cartoons during the 1950s where you'd have a hammer and he's hitting a thumb and the hammer would be Russia, or no, Soviet Union, and the thumb would be Hungary, right? But you could have interchange. The hammer would be recession, the thumb would be, I don't know. It was it, it, very, very basic kind of stuff. And then you get Pat Oliphant coming in from Australia and he revolutionizes cartooning. All of a sudden, instead of being vertical, it's horizontal, and it's funny, and it's just brutal. Um, but it's single panel, right? 
And now we've evolved into something which is more popular with um, the next generation, which is kind of telling stories, you know, multi-panel cartoons that evolve a theme and none of them is right, none of them is wrong, but you know, cartooning is always changing and it's still popular. Okay, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, the, uh, I don't actually see the name of the person who wrote this, but um, so the person wrote, uh, didn't NAS develop a tendency uh, to go uh, in for more unflattering stereotype evoking caricatures of African Americans towards the end of his career? And if I'm right about that, uh, why do you think that happened? So um, I, I don't think that's true. Um, I think you can find unflattering stereotypes of black Americans and other people NAST uh, didn't like, such as Catholics in general and Irish Catholics in particular, throughout his career. Um, and in particular, there were moments in Reconstruction when he drew images of uh, black Americans, which likened them to uh, Irish Catholic immigrants, which in NAST's um, universe was as negative as he would ever get. Um, <laughs> So I would say that actually, I don't think his racism was a function of getting older. I think his uh, racism was a function of accepting lots of ideas that were all around him as true. Um, and he would become outraged on behalf of black Americans when na nasty things, terrible, violent things were done to them. But it's not because he had a profound belief in their equality. It was because it offended him for American values that he idealized to be violated by white people. So um, he hmm. had a particular set of political and cultural commitments around American identity, which he had adopted for himself uh, and which he felt very strongly about. When those were violated by white people, he got angry about that. But it, it wasn't the kind of compassionate, justice-oriented empathy that you would hope for um, from a political commentator neither early in his life nor later. Some of his cartoons are beautiful in their defense of the black community, um, but, but others in the same era are often very negative. As he got older, I think he actually got more radical in some ways. In terms of um, gender, less so, like he got more conservative, but um, in terms of politics, by the time he was in his 50s, he would just burn it all down. Um, I mean, he really, he really stopped compromising after a while. Mm. So we have um, a question for Pat, um, and this is from a person named Bruce. Um, he said, Pat, my father was a car was cartoonist Tex Blaisdell. Uh, one of our dearest family friends was Warren King, political cartoonist for the then conservative New York Daily News. Did you know him? Um, I, I, I didn't. I mean, I've been doing this for over 40 years, 42 years now. Uh, when I started doing cartoons, there were probably 250, almost 300 cartoonists in America who had the gig that I do. You know, they worked for a newspaper and they, they did daily, weekly cartoons. Uh, now we're down to 20. So, you know, back in the day, there used to be a lot of us. You know, going back to NAST, you know, there were lots of cartoonists. Uh, but as far as having a daily newspaper gig, uh, there aren't a lot of us left. Uh, but you can still find us. It's just on the internet. And people are having to really hustle to get their word across. And, and it's out there and it's still vibrant. Uh, but the cartoons and newspapers is from a past era. It's from the NAST era, right? And it had its day and it's still there. But political cartooning has gone to different venues. It's gone to Twitter, and Facebook, and the internet. It's changed. I agree with that. If people love political cartoons, they should really go to Twitter. I know that it may feel shallow, but the political cartoonists on Twitter are deliciously vicious. And I found, I found <laughs> a woman here in Salt Lake City who was, I was looking at these cartoons. I go, who is this person? And then I, you know, click on the bio and I find out she's from Salt Lake City and her name is DL Weeks. Uh, and her handle, I think is Fluffalo Rome. And she's definitely worth looking up. Um, you know, younger than I am, which is not a stretch, <laughs> but, but she's doing great stuff. Well, thank you so much for this. And I hope everybody, you've enticed everybody to go online, masshist.org and see the exhibition. Absolutely. A great exhibition. A really thank you for teeing us up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you for having us. It was a real pleasure.
Uh, Fiona Heller in the book, the biography of Thomas Nast is available. Um, we always choose a locally owned retailer to, to recommend. So in this case, uh, we would recommend that you check out the Harvard Bookstore um, and see, I did check before and it is available through their website um, as well. Um, uh, in the socially distant times, we have continued bringing uh, all of these programs for free. Um, but of course, we pay staff and there's a uh, cost for this. So if you do support these type of programs, we hope that you'll consider uh, joining MHS and making a donation uh, by visiting our website. Um, and someday we will all be back in the same room again uh, and we can actually just you know talk <laughs> that way. <laughs> so uh, until our next program, I hope everyone has a, a great evening.